Good evening. Good to be with you. Uh, had a little bit of trouble here at the church, but I think we're working our way through it. But anyway, we're going to start over and make sure we get everything from the get gat And before we do anything, we are going to pray again, even though I just prayed. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for whom you are. God, you are so merciful, so kind to us. We thank you for your love, that you loved us enough to allow your son Jesus to come and die upon a cross for our salvation. Father, I pray as we go into your word tonight that you guide my thoughts, guide my words, let them be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And Father, let me say what things that need to be said with the grace and mercy through your love and your compassion upon mankind. Father, bless us, we pray, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about sanctification, being a workman, studying to show yourself approved. This time I'm going to take another one of our fundamental truths and speak on it. But I got a little tryst on the end of it. We'll see what happens here. And if I had to title this, actually I've got two titles for it, God or Gods, and then I've got Who Will We Serve? The Bible does not try to argue God's existence. It simply accepts God's existence. When Moses was talking to God in the burning bush, asked who was talking, he said, I am. I am he who was going to take your people out of Israel, lead them out of bondage. The one true God has revealed himself as the eternally self-existent I am, the creator of heaven and earth, the redeemer of mankind. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Isaiah chapter 43, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Simply put, God is. Always has been, always will be. He's like, I was, I am, and I will be. And all we have to do is accept that fact. And I think if we come to Jesus Christ being saved, that we do accept that fact that God exists. We also talk about the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God. One in three, three in one. And I've struggled to come up with an example to explain this, and I really can't come up with anything that's concrete, provable, I remember back when I was a teenager, my dad teaching this course at a youth group in Oak Hill, West Virginia, and he likened the Godhead to a triangle. All three sides form a triangle. Without one side, there is no triangle. But each has their own responsibility. Each has a personality, a job to do, but yet they're so intertwined with each other that you can't separate them. So it's like the old guy says, you get it all or you get none. But the terms Trinity is not really used in the Bible, but if you use it in the correct response, in the correct terminology, correct way, then it applies. In Matthew 28, 19, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And I really like the end of John when Christ was talking to the disciples, telling them to meet him in Galilee after the crucifixion. And I will pray that the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, comfort, comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
when we accept Christ as a personal Savior, we have part of the Holy Spirit within our mind and with our spirit and with our heart. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is completely different from here, and we'll discuss that at a later date. I was reading in one of the books that the Assemblies put out about the 16 Fundamental Truths, and it's a pretty old book, but it's got a lot of good reading in it. One way to describe the Godhead is this. God the Father is principally credited with the work of creation. God the Son is the principal agent in applying the word of redemption to humanity. God the Holy Spirit is the deposit of first installment guaranteeing our future inheritance. Christ told the disciples, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, but I will come back to get you. While he is away, preparing that place for us. The Holy Spirit is in here convicting of sin, giving us words of prophecy, giving us words of knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit, love, healing, and so forth. But you can only go so far with that because they're so intertwined with each other. I really don't believe that they could exist without one another. The Father created through the Son when God created the heaven and the earth. The Holy Spirit hovered in place throughout creation. Creation. The Father sent the Son into the world to effect redemption. And the Son himself and his ministry went in the power of the Spirit. The Father and the Son also share in the Holy Spirit's ministry of sanctifying the believer. One more thing about God. God does not change. He's eternal. He's sovereign. And you go back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, and I'm just going to take the first part of this ver ver verse. For I am the Lord, I do not change. And in this chapter, God is telling the people of Israel, you need to come back to me. I am the one who made the covenant. I am the one that brought you out of the bondage of Egypt. But you keep turning your back on me. You need to turn back to me because I am he. These idols that you worship, they can't do nothing for you. The only thing they can do is sit there and, I guess, make you look dumb because you're looking at them or maybe they looking at you like you're dumb, but, you know, whatever. God has three attributes that, I, that I've learned, and yet you really can't explain it with our fin finite minds that we have here on earth. God has the omnipotence, the quality of being all-powerful. All he enjoys freedom and power to do all that is consistent with his nature. He is sovereign over the universe. God will not do anything outside of his nature. His nature is just, it's loving, but yet he lets us have free will to decide a lot of things. It's up to us to choose correctly. God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. You may not see him in a physical form, but look at nature. Look at the water. Yes, scientists can try to explain so much of this, but it had to be created, and God done that. God is omniscience. He's having infant, inf, infinite, universal, complete knowledge and insight. In other words, he knows what's going to happen five minutes from now, five years from now, 50 years from now. God knows what's going to happen. But it's up to us to do the right thing and to be in the right place. That being said, then why does God allow sin? I don't think God allows sin. We choose to sin. It's part of His 
reasoning or foreknowledge not to determine individual choices. When we accept Christ as a personal Savior, then we've accepted God in our lives. But God will not force us to do anything. It is our choice. It is our free will. We are the ones to decide. If you don't think God doesn't know the future, look at the book of Revelation. And also you can reference back in Daniel and Ezekiel. God has control of this universe. We may not know why this coronavirus is going around, but you know, I honestly believe somewhere, somehow, Christians are going to learn something to glorify God's name because of it. And I think one thing is already happening is you see a lot of people reassociating with their neighbors. They're finally getting out to know who their neighbor is. We've been so busy. I like the one theory, God's decided it's time to, to rest. I'm going to rest you one way or the other, whether you like it or not, but, you know, I'm going to do it. You know, when you talk about rest, that's something that God requires us to do. We need to take a break, rest our bodies, rest our minds, and then get back into the grind. As I said, this is one of the 16 fundamental truths of the assemblies of God. But there is three distinct personalities, but yet they are interwined with each other that there is also one essence of God. Now for my tryst. We know who God is, we know who Jesus is, we know who the Holy Spirit is. One of the Ten Commandments is there is no other God to be worshipped but God. In Exodus chapter 20, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those that hate me, but showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Idolatry can mean a lot of different things. One sense of idolatry is worshiping something like a statue, which the nation of Israel would make golden calves, and then you have the uh, false god Baal, and some others that was in there that they learned from different people, from foreign people, that they didn't do what God had commanded them to do when they took back the promised land, and yet God told them, you have to clean this out, or if not, you will never serve me. Not completely, because you're going to accept what they have in their foreign gods and their idols and worship these and not me. The Bible presents Daniel in the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys paid a price for serving God, but they wouldn't back down. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar, the big image that he, the statue that he had built. He was wanting honor for himself, even though it was God that allowed him to cap capture the nation of Israel because Israel would not do what they needed to do. But I like what they said when the king threatened them. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue, rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold you have set up. 
these three guys was determined they was not going to bow before an idol, a statue, give honor to something that this king wanted them to serve. They took a bold step of faith and they was well educated, you should say, in, in the choice that they made. They was facing a burning furnace. The king ordered it heated up, I think it was seven times more than normal, which I don't know whether they could have actually got that much or not, but it was pretty hot. It killed the men that put these three Hebrews into the furnace. It was that hot. But when the king looked at it, he asked his wise men, did we not throw three in here? But I see four, and the fourth one is like the Son of God, or the Son of Man, walking around. And when they come out of the furnace, not a hair was singed. Their clothes didn't even have smoke in them. And then we look at Daniel. Daniel found favor in captivity. But Daniel had a heart for God. He wanted to know what was going on. He wanted to know from the scriptures that he read, you know, he said, God, we're only supposed to be in exile so many years. When is this up? When are we going to get out of here? The people around Daniel got so jealous that they wanted to get him in trouble for doing something. They could find no fault with him. So the only way around it was to get the king to sign a degree that nobody could pray to God. They had to pray to uh, their king. But Daniel never refused. Dan Daniel refused to give up his prayer time. In the morning, he prayed, looking out toward, I I'd like to think, Jerusalem. Daniel had to go into the lion's den. The king was so disturbed, so tore up. He tried and tried to find a way out of it, but he couldn't because he'd already signed it with his seal. There was no backing, taking it back. There was no changing it. It had to be. But God shut the mouth of the lions, kept them from devouring Daniel. The king was so frustrated, so tired of these people wanting to find fault when they shouldn't be looking for fault. They need to be doing what they need to be doing. That he put them in the den and I think the lions had a feast. And that's enough said about that. Everyone has a reason to do something. <clears throat> in my 20 plus years that I walked away from Christianity. The only reason I had was to work. And other things that took the place of God. When I come back, I decided I was going to root myself in the word of God. Not only that, I was going to pray. And I know some of you think this is a little bit silly, but even when I'm so tired after being up all night at the hotel or even at home, I want to read God's Word. I've seen the time that my tablet literally falls out of my hands. I'm so tired. I wake up, I go back at it again because I'm not going to bed until I read. That is the difference. Idolatry is not defined by ge geography or culture, but by the objects of worship that are not God, which may be spiritual or physical. These persons that I'm about to name, man, they made an impact on Christianity. Martin Luther, Matthew Henry, John Calvin, John Wesley. And I like what Martin Luther wrote about idolatry consists not merely in erecting an image and worshiping it, but rather in the heart which stands gaping at something else, seeks help and consolation from the creatures, saints or devils, and neither cares for God, 
who looks to him for so much good as to believe that he is willing to help. Neither believes that whatever good it experiences comes from God. <clears throat> it's like that hitting on the head. <clears throat> I think sometimes we don't realize what we are making our God instead of God. One of the biggest reasons I walked away from Christianity is I've seen a lot of people said they was Christians. But when you looked at their lives that they led, they was anything but. I used to go over my mind thinking about this. Well, I know four people I can name off the top of my head that not only do they believe what they believe, but they walk that walk. It's more than talk, they walk what they believe. And that would have to be my dad, my grandfather, and my brother. Actually, both of my grandfathers. One was a minister in the church, uh, church of God, in the Assemblies of God, which I had the privilege of being under him for a couple of years. My other grandfather taught Wednesday night services for years and years and years. He loved the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. And I know some people will think this is a little silly, but I, I literally seen the time my grandfather and my dad would go at it for hours, not in a, in a bad way, never, because they didn't believe in that. But they would be so rooted in their convictions with the Bible to back it up that they would sit and talk for hours. And they come to the conclusion that they was going to agree to disagree agreeably. They wasn't another one of them going to budge. But they knew what they stood for. They knew why. And they knew that they served a God that would give them the knowledge and the wisdom that they needed. And not only that, but the grace and mercy that they needed each and every day. I believe this whole subject that we've been talking about falls in line with sanctification and true salvation. We have to know why God exists. We have to know why Jesus Christ come and died for our sins. And we need to accept the Holy Spirit for what he is. He's a comforter. He's the God is to give us the knowledge that we need when we need it to recall, recall the scripture when we need to recall that scripture, putting us in the right place to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. Our commitment to God requires a lifestyle change. Instead of serving ourselves, we want to serve God. Are we going to be perfect? Not in a million years. Every day I ask for God to make me a better person, to make me a better Christian, to have a better attitude. I'm one of these guys, I know within two seconds whether I'm going to like you or not. You know, some of you are shaking your head, but the, the sad part of it is I'm about 98% correct. I've been fooled very few times from my first impression. So that's a battle for me not to prejudge somebody, but to try to put myself in the place that I'm not judgmental towards somebody because of a gut feeling or an instinct that I have. Many of you that know me, especially this in this church, have heard me lead prayers on Sunday morning. And my cry for a long time is protection upon our churches. Do not allow the evil to come through the doors. My honor-bound chaplain, Keith Turcotte, the last time he was in, in with us, spoke about believing God to save those who commit heinous acts. The last two weeks, my prayer for protection of the church has taken this stand. 
God stopped the evil before it ever comes in the driveway. But that person or people that want to commit that act of violence, let us reach out in love. Let us reach out and grab them by the hand and say, let me lead you to Jesus Christ, and he will change your life forever. He will give you the peace that you're looking for. The book of Psalms is just a great, a great book, especially in 119. I, I've been reading it for the last two weeks in my devotions. The love that David had for God, the way that he wrote some of the Psalms in despair, his life was on the, on the edge. His life was on the, about to be killed by his enemies. But yet David cried out to God to come and to save him, to bless him in the middle of his enemies, to deliver him. There's so much about the Bible that we will never comprehend it all. But I will assure any and every one of you this one thing. If you allow God to come into your life, make him the God of your life. He will change your life. We have to make that lifestyle change if we're going to serve God. I believe that with all of my heart. And anybody that don't, I don't think they've really asked Jesus Christ into their life. There's a guy that I worked with made a comment to me one time. Christianity is the only place I know that I can go to heaven, but yet I can murder somebody. And when he said that to me, I said, well, wait a minute. Just remember this. There's a price to pay for sin. I may come to Jesus Christ and accept him as a personal savior, but there's a price to pay for my sins. The good thing is, when Jesus paid that price, it's all forgotten about, never to be brought up again. I like what I read. It's like God throws them out in, in the river or in the lake or in the sea, and he says, no fishing allowed. Hands off. So I have two questions to end this. Who or what are we putting in front of God in our lives? The second question, are we going to serve God or other things in our lives? See, God gives us a free choice. It's our choice. We have to decide. We have to make the initiative. I know there's an old saying that God only helps them that help themselves, which honestly I believe it to a point. But sometimes we want to do too much and not let God do what he needs to do. It's, it's a fine line sometimes. But if we apply ourselves to prayer and, and to the study of the word and coming back to our churches as they open up in this time, we need each other. That's where we gain our strength. That's where we gain our faith is from each other and hearing the word of God brought forth on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or through live stream that we're doing here at our church. Another one of my prayers has been, I don't know, I'm getting a little bit off the subject, but I just feel like I, I need to say this, is our smaller churches. Churches that maybe only have 10 or 15 on a Sunday morning. Maybe they don't have the finances to bring them through this time that we're going through. And again, my prayer every day, God let our bigger churches reach out and help our smaller churches. Help us to be that brother and sister in Christ Jesus. Let us set that example to other believers. And God will bless us beyond our greatest ideals or expectations because we have chosen to put God first. I, I've told my pastor many times I would drill it over a dollar and have God's blessing as to have a million dollars in the bank 
Because if I've got God's blessings, man, that's all I need. I'm going to close with a prayer. And, and again, as I close, I'm going to ask you to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior if you haven't not already. See, if we don't do this, then we have no reason to exist. God sent his son to die on a cruel, cruel cross that we would have a choice to make to serve him or serve Satan. And that's basically the two choices that we have. I believe that with all my heart. You can say, well, I'm going to live for a little while and then I'll come back to Christianity. Remember this. I have no promise of the next second. I have no promise of the next minute. I have no promise of the next day. And I'm one of those that, that took that chance. And my biggest regret is this. What could I have done for God instead of walking away? How many more people could I have shared a testimony with that Jesus saves instead of trying to join the crowd and be with the crowd. It was fun for a little bit, but I looked toward heaven. I looked toward God. I looked for that eternal life, spending with Him around the throne. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, I ask, invite, ask you to invite Him into your heart. It's real simple. All you have to do is say, God, I am a sinner but I accept the fact that you died upon Calvary for my sins. Your blood brought and paid for my redemption, my, my relationship with, Jesus, with God. Your death upon that cross paid it all. And through God's mercy, I can do, live for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for what you've done. Father, I pray that these words have read out. Father, I know that it's not a glory, hallelujah kind of talk. But Father, we must know who we serve today. And we know that we have to put you first in our lives. And I pray through the ministry outreach of Living Waters that this is accomplished each and every time that we have a live stream or in a church service that we care about those that are lost, those that are hurting, and Father, reach out like Christ reached out to us, that being that supreme example of how to live a, a Christian life. Father, we pray for our services as they open up tomorrow. Father, give us the wisdom and knowledge that we need to handle the situations that will arise. But Father, I pray for a spirit of cooperation amongst everybody that comes back into your house. Not only living waters, but Father, into other churches as they go, prepare to worship you. And Father, once again, for our smaller churches, let us reach out unto them. Let us give them a helping hand that they may stay afloat, that they may stay with their doors open. Father, I pray for our pastor tomorrow morning as he leads our service. Father, I pray that you anoint him with anointing that of the Holy Spirit. Father, bless him, give him the words of wisdom that he needs to say. And Father, refresh him, not only spiritually, but Father, mentally and physically. And Father, may your blessings overflow from living waters to the next church, to the next church, to the next town to the county, to the state, to the nation, to the world. Let us have an outpouring that of the Holy Spirit upon our service and in our lives. God, we give you the praise and the glory for all that you have done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and see you at church on Sunday morning.